Hey everybody, today I am out here in rainy Tucson, Arizona, taking a look at the first ever Honda CRV Hybrid. This is Honda's probably most anticipated model over the last few years, and Honda has finally decided to hybridize their popular compact crossover, obviously to compete very directly with the Toyota RAV4 Hybrid. So we're here to find out what's the fuel economy like, what are the changes on the inside, and do you really want one? Up front, the CRV Hybrid doesn't deviate from the formula too much. We have a blue Honda logo, just as you'd expect in a modern hybrid. All versions are going to get LED headlamps up front. These are reflector designs, not projector designs like we see in some of the competition. And overall, Honda has toned down the chrome up front just a little bit versus some of the options that we see in this segment. So we have black bars here, subtle chrome accent right there, and then a slightly different treatment down at the bottom where we also get LED fog lamps. We have parking sensors up front and in the back, which is definitely a nice touch for 2020. At 182.1 inches long, the CRV is solidly a compact crossover in America. Now, for 2020, it does seem a little bit longer than it was before, but that primarily has to do with the way the bumpers are designed. We don't get any extra room on the inside. And in fact, we do lose a little bit because of the hybrid system, but that all happens back here in the cargo area, which we'll see a little bit later. One of the big advantages to the CRV hybrid over the RAV4 hybrid, however, as we're going to take a look at in a bit, is overall rear legroom and overall combined legroom front plus rear. It's definitely larger than we find in the RAV. We also have a very practical cargo area in the back because as you can see, we have a pretty upright rear end. When it comes to active safety, Honda has tossed everything into the 2020 CRV. We have standard radar adaptive cruise control with forward collision warning, collision mitigating braking, lane departure warning, road departure mitigation. We also have available blind spot monitoring and available parking sensors for 2020. This model has just about everything on it, but it is worth noting that very much like the RAV4, blind spot monitoring and the parking sensors are not standard. Moving around to the rear, changes are fairly minor for 2020. We do get a new lower bumper for the hybrid model that disguises the exhaust tips. They're tucked up under the rear. We get a pretty subtle hybrid badge right over there. And then an all-wheel drive badge because all hybrid models are going to be all-wheel drive, very much like we see in the Toyota lineup in America. We have some subtle amounts of chrome back here and the same tail lamp modules that sort of look like an upside down question mark to me. Be sure and let me know what you think about the overall design of the CRV down there in the comments section below. I think that overall it is definitely a handsome crossover, but it has been around in America for a while, and I had hoped that the changes would be a little bit more drastic for 2020. So if you like the way the CRV looks, you're going to like this one. If you thought the CRV needed a bit of a refresh, then you may be a bit disappointed by the 2020. Under the hood, we find essentially the same hybrid system that we find in the Honda Accord Hybrid. This shares the same engine and the same basic two-motor hybrid system. This is a little bit different than what we see in the Clarity and the Insight. At the heart of this is a two-liter four-cylinder engine. It produces 143 horsepower and 129 pound-feet of torque. That is a little bit smaller and a little bit less powerful than the gasoline engine that we see in the RAV4 Hybrid. If you want to know more about how Honda's two-motor hybrid system works, there is a separate detailed video on the channel where we take a deep dive into the way this system works and how it compares to other hybrids out there on the market. Some folks out there have described this system as a CVT or eCVT, but in the truest sense of the word, this vehicle has no true transmission. The engine is connected to a single motor generator unit that can generate power or start the engine, and then on the other side of the transmission, we have a 181 horsepower drive motor, and that's what's moving the vehicle forward below speeds of about 45 miles an hour hour or so, and that's the one that's going to give you the maximum 232 pound-feet of torque. So in many driving situations, 181 horsepower, 232 pound-feet of torque is going to be your maximum output. But at higher speeds, when the engine can be directly connected to the wheels via a clutch unit, then the system can give you a total of 212 horsepower, which is a little bit above what we see in the RAV4 hybrid system. The big change for this hybrid system versus the Accord hybrid is that we have a mechanical all-wheel drive system, not an e-all-wheel drive system or an electric rear axle like we find in something like the RAV4 hybrid. This has basically the same design of mechanical all-wheel drive that we find in the regular CRV, updated of course for the hybrid system. And that means that very much like the Ford Escape Hybrid, this is going to be more off-road capable, more wet weather capable than we see in the RAV4 hybrid, where it cannot send as much power to the rear axle as this system can. When fuel economy numbers were announced for the 2020 CRV Hybrid, some folks were disappointed because this is now rated for 38 mpg combined. When you take a look at the chart on the side of your screen, you'll notice that city fuel economy is 40 mpg. That's pretty close to what we see in the RAV4 Hybrid, but highway fuel economy comes in at 35 miles per gallon. That's really only about a 2 mile per gallon bump over the 1.5 liter turbo CRV. 
And most importantly, that's 3 mpg below what we see in the RAV4 hybrid, and that's why this overall gives you 2 mpg less. But let's talk about why that is. Now, we don't know all the answers to this because some of these details are lost in the overall aerodynamics, the shape of the vehicle, the design of the hybrid system, etc. But there are a few good clues here. First, we have wider tires. 235 with tires here versus 225 with tires on all RAV4 hybrid models. And tire size and overall tire width definitely has an impact on fuel economy. We also have the mechanical all-wheel drive system. So this system can send power mechanically to the rear axle whenever it needs to, and it seems to be more aggressive at sending power to the rear than we find in the RAV4 hybrid. That's going to give this a more sure-footed feel, but it also is going to overall reduce your fuel economy. The two vehicles are pretty similar in terms of overall curb weight. Both are around 37 to 3,800 pounds, depending on the options that you get. But the big difference is going to be the way the all-wheel drive system and the hybrid system are designed. In addition to the mechanical all-wheel drive system giving us slightly more friction loss than we would find in an electric all-wheel drive setup, the very design of this hybrid system also seems to give us slightly lower highway fuel economy, especially at higher speeds. That's what we also see in something like the Honda Accord hybrid. Two miles per gallon is not a huge difference. Now you will see a little bit more if you're out on a longer road trip, but personally, I think the mechanical all-wheel drive system is worth that slight loss in overall efficiency. For some reason, Honda has said that the CRV Hybrid has no tow rating at all, which I thought was a little bit interesting since the RAV4 Hybrid is rated to tow 1,750 pounds in America and notably more than 2,000 pounds in Europe. We also have a loss of cargo capacity back here versus the non-hybrid CRV, something different than we see in the RAV4. 39.2 cubic feet in the non-hybrid model goes down to 33.2 for the hybrid version because the battery is right here under the load floor and Toyota puts their battery under the rear seats. For most practical purposes, the loss in cargo capacity is not going to be a big deal. I expect the 24-inch roller bag score to be exactly the same as the non-hybrid model. Instead, we lose space right here under the load floor. You'll notice that we have this big plastic divider here and then a little well where we put the can of fix the flat and the tire inflator kit. And that's really all the extra area that we get back here. There's no room for a spare tire back here like we do find in the RAV4, no extra cargo capacity under the floor. But there is still plenty of room for 22-inch roller bags back here. You can see that these almost fit right there below the roller cover. And all the cargo practicality that we've seen in the CRV for a while is still here. So we can still fold the rear seats down using these handles right here in the back. They flop down very nicely there. And they are completely flat with the cargo area in the rear. So it's very easy to roll cargo right back there into the interior. And because the interior is a little bit larger than the RAV4 to begin with, even with the loss of cargo space under the load floor, the overall cargo space behind the front row seats is about the same as the RAV4 Hybrid. The big thing to know about the CRV Hybrid on the inside is that this is still a CRV. So we still have the same seat design that we find in the rest of the CRV lineup. This top end touring trim is one of the most comfortable seats in this segment, and it has a four way lumbar support, something I really like. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion. Something that you find in this top end touring model that we don't find available in the RAV4 Hybrid is a power passenger seat. Rear seat legroom is a big advantage for the CRV hybrid over the other hybrid options out there. You can see with this front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall, I have about six or seven inches of legroom left. I also have about three inches of headroom left. And even if I move into the middle seat position, I still have about two and a half inches of headroom left. This is a very accommodating rear seat. Honda's also done a good job making sure that the rear seat area feels just about as premium as the front. So the front door panels have a little bit more soft touch plastic, but the overall design is very similar and there's still a decent number of soft touch points. Rear seat passengers have a center padded armrest with cup holders right there. The seats recline in a two stage method and you can fold them right here from inside the vehicle or from in the back as well. But perhaps the bigger deal back here versus the RAV4 is the child seat capability. In a RAV4, you can't really put an adult, you certainly couldn't put me up front and then put a rear-facing child seat behind, but you can in the CRV. There's definitely enough room back here for that. Now on the downside, the lap and shoulder belt comes out of the ceiling, and that is not my preference. It does cause the child seat to get skewed to one side if you have one in the middle. It also takes up a little bit of that cargo room bite back there in the ceiling. On the inside, we have a few changes for 2020, although they are fairly minor, and we have a few changes for the hybrid model versus the non-hybrid as well. We have fairly bolstered front seats right there. You can see these are the leather seats. These are a gray. We have perforated sections in the middle, although these seats are not ventilated. They are just heated. Since we're driving the top end two ring model, we have slightly different imitation wood trim right there on the doors and on the dashboard in this two-tone design. And then moving over here to the center console, we find the seven inch infotainment screen that is optional. We still have touch buttons over here on the left side, which is not my preference, but this does give us smartphone integration, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Not standard, however, you do have to work your way one level up in the trim ladder in order to get that. 
two zone automatic climate control. And then we have the big change right here on the dashboard where we have a push button shifter module that looks like it's been borrowed from Acura rather than the more traditional console shifter that we find in the non-hybrid version. Moving down from there, we find a wireless charging mat, two USB input ports. The one on the left here is the one that interfaces with the smartphone integration. The center console has been redesigned a little bit for 2020. We still have a very softly padded center armrest right there, but it opens to reveal a newly designed storage area right here in the middle. It's a little bit bigger and more practical. We have this divider that slides forward and backward, and then it lifts up out of the way so that we could put large items right here into the center. For instance, small shopping bags, purses, that sort of thing. They will fit right there, and then you can still close this lid and then slide it right in front. On the driver's side, we have basically the same partial LCD instrument cluster that we had before with revised software to give us the status of the all-wheel drive system and, of course, the hybrid system as well. We have the same steering wheel that we find in the non-hybrid model. We have the radar adaptive cruise control controls over here on the right side and then infotainment controls over there on the left. As you'd expect, out on the road, the CRV Hybrid feels an awful lot like the Accord Hybrid because we have basically the same engine and same drive motors under the hood. But this certainly feels an awful lot more sure-footed. And you'll really notice that if we come to a full stop here and then we just floor it because we don't have any torque steer like we find in the Accord Hybrid. And we don't have any scrabble for traction because we have that true mechanical all-wheel drive system. And that, again, is going to be very different than what we find in the RAV4. The RAV4, you can get a little bit of torque steer depending on the surface, a little bit of front wheel scrabble out on a looser surface before we have some power sent to the rear. Now, in terms of overall acceleration, this does appear to be a little bit slower than the RAV4 Hybrid. Now, we aren't at home to test this officially back to back with the RAV4 Hybrid that we have. But in our initial tests out here in Tucson, 0 60 happened in 8.4 seconds. That surprised me a little bit because the Accord Hybrid seems just about as fast as the Camry Hybrid, and I had expected this to be a little bit closer than the RAV4 Hybrid in terms of overall performance. We don't have any official braking scores because it has been very, very wet out here the whole day. This is about the driest that it has been the whole time that we've been out here in Tucson, so it doesn't seem fair to do a preliminary 60 to 0 run, but I suspect this is going to be about the same as the regular CRV. Overall curb weight has increased a little bit, but because some of that weight has been sent to the rear and we have 235 with tires on all models, I think this is probably going to come in right around 120 feet or so. Thanks to those wider tires, the CRV feels like it has a more sure-footed feel out on the road, so I suspect this is probably going to outhandle the RAV4 Hybrid. Now again, we will have more details on that once we get this back at home. Like the rest of Honda's hybrid lineup, the CRV feels very much like an EV out on the road because below 45 miles an hour, this is only capable of driving in EV mode. Now that may sound odd because of course the engine is on right now, but it's an electric vehicle that is backed by an engine and a generator and a smaller battery pack rather than just a big battery pack like we find in something like a Nissan Leaf. But the way this feels when you floor it, it feels like a Nissan Leaf, not like something with a traditional CVT, not like one of Toyota's hybrid systems. And even above 45 miles an hour, it's still going to uncouple that clutch and still generate power with the engine and send it over to the electric motor for acceleration. Until you reach higher speeds, definitely outside the norm for America, that's when the clutch would then be able to close again and give you the maximum power output. A nice touch with Honda's hybrid systems is that the paddle shifters on the back of the steering wheel control the regen braking. So we have regen braking in four different modes. There's no true coasting mode. We always get a little bit of regen out of this system. But I really like the fact that these shift paddles give you that extra regen feel. And that's something that we don't see in Toyota's hybrids for some reason. It gives us an awful lot more control. It's very similar to what we see in Kia and Hyundai's hybrids. Now on the downside, much like the rest of Honda's hybrid lineup, if it's not in sport mode, then it won't remember your regen braking settings. So if I have it on aggressive regen braking, it's fairly aggressive for a hybrid here. It'll take us down to a reasonably slow speed, not true one pedal driving or anything like that. But if I start driving again, it will forget that setting after a short while. Unless we put it in sport mode, then it will remember the regen brake setting. Fuel economy is a little bit difficult to talk about because we haven't been driving this on our own home turf. However, Honda did have a RAV4 hybrid for us to drive back to back with this in terms of an overall fuel economy loop. We'll put the results displayed by the computer on the screen. They're not going to be too far off to be perfectly honest. Over a day of driving this vehicle so far and about 60 miles, we've been averaging about 34 to 35 miles per gallon. That is below the EPA score. However, as I said before, our own RAV4 at home gets below its EPA score. The Delta is pretty similar. Honda tells us that they've spent some time trying to match the engine revs with the acceleration that we're getting out of the electric motor. And that relationship definitely feels a little bit more linear than in the past, but it's never going to be perfectly right. And again, that's because below certain speeds or even above 45 miles an hour, depending on what you're asking of the drivetrain, this is gonna be a serial hybrid where there is no mechanical relationship between the engine revs and the wheel revs. 
To be perfectly honest, I'm not quite sure why some people were ever bothered by the non-linear relationship of the engine revs and the acceleration. As long as the vehicle is accelerating, I don't really care what the engine is up to under the hood. In general terms, I prefer the way that Honda's two-motor hybrid system feels out on the road versus the planetary systems that we find from Toyota, from Ford, and of course from FCA as well. It's because this feels a little bit more like an EV. We have more of a linear feel to the way that this accelerates. There's just a little bit of lag as the engine starts spinning up to generate that power, but overall this feels more like an EV and less like the average hybrid out on the road. This definitely feels an awful lot smoother in its nature than some of the hybrid systems that we find from Hyundai and Kia. But on the other hand, if you prefer a car that has more of a traditional automatic transmission feel, you're not going to find that in this, but you will find it in those alternatives. So Honda has given us a, uh, a sand area to play in. This should be interesting. Uh, we're going to start out in a RAV4 hybrid first. They want us to do sort of figure eights here and see how the system really performs. You can see that, you know, we're definitely very front heavy on the power delivery here. A um, lot of stability control interaction, but I've always been fairly impressed with Toyota's e all-wheel drive system and its overall capability. They've certainly improved it over time, and in the trail mode, it, it still can get you down an off-road trail if you want to, but it has this very strong front wheel feel to it, because again, it can't ever send as much power to the rear as it would like. Now let's hop into the CRV hybrid and see how this differs. We have that mechanical all-wheel drive system, which means it's going to feel basically the same as the regular CRV out on the road. You can really feel that the all-wheel drive system is able to send more power to the rear. Uh, you can still get all kinds of crazy out on a track like this, but it definitely is more like you would expect out of a traditional all-wheel drive system car. You can really see those rear wheels doing their thing out here. We're make, doing a lot of agricultural plowing. I didn't know Honda made tractors, but hey. In a surprising move, Honda has priced the CRV hybrid very aggressively. It starts at $27,750. Remember, we do get all-wheel drive standard, and that is going to be less expensive than the Toyota RAV4 hybrid, which I already thought was a pretty good deal in this segment. Now, there is one little caveat that you need to know about, and that is if I take a look at this price list right in front of me, you have to pardon me for holding this, but we just got the pricing details. The 7-inch infotainment system and Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are still not standard in that base model. If you want those features, then you will have to go up to $30,260 for the EX trim. They expect that to be more of a volume trim than the absolute base model, but you will find some of those features standard on a lot of the competition. You will also find a slightly larger infotainment system in them as well. If you're interested in real leather upholstery, it is available in the CRV. It's not available in the RAV4 Hybrid for some reason. That'll set you back at least $32,750. And the absolute top of the line model comes in just under $36,000. And that's what we're driving right here. Now, when you take a look at the feature set on this model, it is a very good deal compared to the top end trims of the RAV4 Hybrid, surprisingly so, because not all trims of the CRV are necessarily the best deal compared against some of their direct competition. The model I've spent all my time in today is the top-end two-ring trim. This came in just under $36,000, of course, before tax, title, destination, etc. That is going to be a little bit less expensive than a comparably equipped RAV4 hybrid. Now, unlike the RAV4 hybrid or the Ford Escape hybrid, we don't find a full LCD instrument cluster like we do find available in the Ford. We don't have a bigger infotainment system like we do find in the RAV4. But I think that overall the CRV interior is more to my taste. I like the overall style more than we find in the RAV4. Overall parts quality is relatively similar in those top end trims, but I do think these seats are a little bit more comfortable and I like the overall design a bit more. And again, we have that mechanical all wheel drive system, which is gonna make a pretty big difference to some folks out there. Bottom line for 2020, we have some excellent options available in America if you're interested in a compact crossover with a fuel efficient hybrid system. Now, there is gonna be an upcoming plug-in hybrid version of the RAV4 and an upcoming plug-in hybrid of the 40 escape and because of this overall hybrid system design i don't expect to see a plug-in hybrid crv anytime soon probably not until the crv gets a complete redesign because the battery pack is already occupying that entire area where the spare tire would go in the cargo area if they were to put a bigger battery pack back here it would really limit the overall cargo area and overall practicality of the crv so if you're looking for a plug-in hybrid it looks like the rav4 prime and the 40 skate plug-in hybrid are going to be the options that you should be interested in keep in mind the 40 skate does not get all-wheel drive but the RAV4 gets the e-all-wheel drive system. Not as capable as we find here, but it is gonna give you a plug-in hybrid range. Expect that video coming up later in 2020. But at the moment, if you're looking for a fuel-efficient hybrid, 
I have to admit, I think that the CRV would be my top pick in the segment at the moment. Stay tuned because we will have a full head on review between this and our long term Rev4 just as soon as we can get our hands on one. In the meantime, be sure and head over to facebook.com slash alexnautos. Find us on Instagram, Twitter, all those other social things. Hit that subscribe button down there if you haven't already done so. Be sure and check out those merch links down there too, and I'll see you next week.